Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the Physics Program at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. Today we'll talk about Chapter 2, which covers the origin, composition, and structure of the atmosphere. Weather and climatic issues in one part of the world can affect those in the other, in other parts. For example, North African dust storms can affect the weather and air quality in the southeastern U.S. Dust, dust particles can harbor microscopic disease-causing organisms. This dust can also harm the coral reefs and it may increase the frequency of red tides. So in this chapter what we're going to talk about is what the composition and structure of the atmosphere is. We'll also talk about how meteorologists monitor the atmosphere at the surface and up in the upper atmosphere. We'll look at the temperature profile of the atmosphere, the thermal subdivisions of the atmosphere, and finally the electromagnetic characteristics of the upper atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of gases and suspended particles. Half of the mass of the atmosphere is found in the lower 5,500 meters. So anybody who's ran a five kilometer race knows that 5,000 meters is pretty close to three miles. So we see half the mass of the atmosphere lies about three miles from the surface of the Earth. 99% of it is in the lowest 32 kilometers or 20 miles of the Earth. We make two definitions here. First we'll talk about the weather. The weather is the state of the atmosphere as defined by temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed and wind direction at a specific time and place. Climate is the average weather averaged over a specific period. So we average the weather over a 30 year period beginning with the first year of the decade. Meteorology is the study of the weather Climatology is the study of the climate. So let's look at how the atmosphere started. First we have the primeval phase. So here the gases were primarily helium and hydrogen. Eventually these gases escaped off into space. So how does a gas escape? Well, consider a baseball. If you toss the baseball up, it goes up a few feet and it falls back down to your hand. If you throw it up faster, it will go higher. Eventually, if you're really good, you can throw it at such a speed that it'll actually escape the Earth's gravitational pull. This is known as the escape velocity. So, if molecules are running fast enough or moving around fast enough, they can actually escape the atmosphere. And this speed that they have to do it is called the escape velocity. How fast these molecules are moving depends on their temperature. So what we'll find in a few chapters is that the temperature is actually a measure of the kinetic energy, that's energy due to motion, of these particles, these gas particles. So the higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy they're, they're, they have, which means that they're moving faster. A physicist defines kinetic energy as one-half the mass times the velocity squared. This escape velocity depends on how strong the pull of gravity is. 
So for example, the moon has a much smaller gravitational force than the earth does. It actually depends on the mass of the planet, how strong the gravitational pull is. So on the moon, the escape velocity is a lot slower than it is on the earth. Therefore, it's easier for molecules, gas molecules, to escape the moon's surface. So if the moon had an atmosphere at some time, it may have escaped. So at the beginning, there wasn't enough gravity on the Earth. And what happens is this, a this atmosphere of helium and hydrogen escaped. About 4.4 billion years ago, there was enough gravity to retain an atmosphere. So now we had rocks that were outgassing as they solidified and cooled, primarily with carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. There was also trace amounts of methane, ammonia, and sulfur dioxide. Water vapor was broken into hydrogen and oxygen by UV radiation from the sun. So about 4.5 to 2.5 billion years ago, the sun was much uh, fainter, but the earth was not cooler due to the CO2, the greenhouse gases. CO2 combined with rainwater to form carbonic acid, and it rained on the rocks and reacted with the rocks, and it locked carbon into the rocks so there was less in the atmosphere. Living organisms took the carbon dioxide, or CO2, out of the atmosphere via photosynthesis, and this locked carbon into carbohydrates. Oxygen then became the second most abundant gas in the atmosphere, the first being nitrogen. Carbon dioxide has been a minor component of the atmosphere for the last 2.5 billion years. It appears that the fluctuations in CO2 play an important role in climate change. Now we have the modern phase. So the lower, lower atmosphere, that's about 80 kilometers or about 50 miles, circulates and maintains uniform ratios of gases. This is known as the homosphere. So everything's homogenized, right, like milk. So there isn't a separation of the liquid and the fats. On the atmosphere, there's a good mixture of oxygen and nitrogen and the other gases. This is good, so that this means that there aren't sections of the world that don't have any oxygen and other sections that do. Above this, above the homosphere, gases are separated based on their weight, and it results in stratified layers. This is known as the heterosphere. The atmosphere is approximately 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. So 78 plus 21 is about 99. So this takes care of 99% of the atmosphere. The next highest concentration is argon, that's less than a percent, and CO2, which is less than 0.04%. So here's a more complete list. Right, so nitrogen is about 78.08, and nitrogen is, exists as a diatomic molecule, so there's two nitrogen atoms stuck together. The same thing with oxygen. It, cons it uh, consists as, as O2, so another diatomic molecule. Then comes argon and carbon dioxide, and then there's trace amounts of hydrogen, xenon, and ozone. Ozone is 
three atoms of molecule, it's O3. Water vapor is not included in this chart because it varies greatly and therefore we don't include it in this table. So we have oxygen as O2 in the homosphere and as a single molecule in a heterosphere. So this is about 150 kilometers or 95 miles above the Earth's surface. What happens is the ultraviolet radiation that comes in from the Sun splits up these molecules. Other planets' atmospheres are much different. They may have started out the same as ours but changed as time went on. The Earth's atmosphere also has aerosols. These are liquid and solid particles. The sources of these aerosols are wind erosion of soil, forest fires, ocean spray, volcanic eruptions, and agricultural and industrial activities. By volume, water vapor is less than 4% of the lowest kilometer of the atmosphere, but it's necessary for clouds and precipitation. CO2 is essential for life and for photosynthesis, and yet it's less than 0.04 percent of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide and water vapor both absorb and emit infrared radiation. This keeps our lower atmosphere warm and it allows for life to exist. These are greenhouse gases. So if we lost all of the greenhouse gases, then our atmosphere would cool down and we wouldn't be able to live here. We also have air pollutant pollution and an air pollutant is defined as an aerosol or gas that occurs at a concentration that threatens the well-being of living organisms. Most are man-made, some are natural. So the natural forms, we have dust storms and volcanoes, pollen, and the decay of plant and animal life. We break up the pollutants into two, for, into two categories, primary air pollutants, which are harmful immediately as soon as they are admitted. And secondary air pollutants, they're harmful after combinations with other, with one or more other substances. So for instance, we have photochemical smog. The Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, sets up standards for pollutants. So the standards for six air pollutants, carbon monoxide, lead, ozone, nitrogen oxides, particulates, and sulfur dioxide. Primary air quality standards are the maximum exposure that humans can, can tolerate without any ill effects. Secondary air standards, air quality standards, are maximum exposures levels allowable to minimize impact on crops, visibility, personal comfort, and climate. Compliance with these standards are seen as the attainment areas where the standards are met or below and not attainment areas which are geographical regions where the primary standard is not met. We can't have a science course without talking about the scientific method. With the scientific method, what we do is identify questions related to a problem or a process. Then we propose an answer to one of these to one of the questions. And this is called an educated guess. Once we state the educated guess in a manner that can be tested, this is called a hypothesis. Then we predict the outcome as if the hypothesis was correct, and we test the hypothesis. 
If it's correct, we keep testing. If it's wrong, then we go ahead and revise the hypothesis, or if it's really bad, we throw it out. If the hypothesis, we keep testing it and testing it and testing it, and it keeps coming up correct, then it becomes a scientific theory. We use models to help investigate scientific processes or processes scientifically. And these models are approximations or simulations of the real system. The Earth atmosphere systems can be modeled using conceptual models. This is an abstract idea that represents some fundamental law or relationship. So for example, the geostrophic wind we'll talk about in a couple of chapters. What happens here is that as we go really high up in the atmosphere, instead of wind blowing from high pressure to low pressure, it actually blows parallel to isobars and isobars are lines of constant pressure. The reason for this is that the pressure gradient force, the force that pushes it from high pressure to low pressure, is in balance with the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect is due to the turning of the Earth. So the conceptional model is to put a picture in your head of, about what the process that's going on. We also have graphical models. So a good example of this is a weather map. So we take a bunch of data and we plot it in a presentation that's easy to see, right? And give you an idea of what's happening in the atmosphere. We also have physical models. This is a miniaturized version of a system. These are not used extremely often in atmospheric physics or in meteorology. The reason being is it's because it's really hard to make a miniaturized version of something. One example of a physical model is the tornado vortex chamber shown here where we can kind of get an idea of how wind can start turning in a circle. But it's really hard to come up with a like a little miniaturized tabletop model of the United States and have a little tiny hurricane coming and crashing into its shore. Right? That doesn't work very well. We can make small processes like this tornado vortex chamber. And it doesn't reproduce a tornado, but it does give us an idea of how things how wind turns in a circle. Today, what my research is in and what we use a lot are computer models. Here what we do is we feed into the computer a bunch of equations on how the atmosphere reacts to certain forcings. So for instance, sunlight comes in, how the atmosphere changes as the sun comes up. This is also a good idea for um, testing theories about global warming. So we think that global warming may result if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide. So what happens is we put the amount of carbon dioxide that's presently in the atmosphere into our computer model and we run it and see what happens. Then we add more CO2 and run it again and see if the answer changes. All of these models have inherent errors. So for the computerized, for the computer models, we have to use averages or we have to make approximations a lot of times. So what we have to do is we start with what the atmosphere looks like today and then run the computer, the computer model and see how the atmosphere will look tomorrow. but we don't have a complete picture of what the atmosphere looks like today. We can take a whole lot of readings, but we don't have a reading for every point in the atmosphere of the pressure, temperature, 
humidity, wind speed, and wind direction. So we have to make approximations. So if we want to make approximation, if we want to make predictions of what's going to happen in the atmosphere, we have to know what's going on today. So first thing we do is take surface observations. Surface observations have begun back as, as, as far as 1644 in North America, right, with the old Swedes Fort in Wilmington, Delaware. And this had the first systematic observations. Philadelphia began in about 1731. And in New Haven, Connecticut, we have records from 1781 that continued uninterrupted till today. Most of this started with the Army. So they were looking at weather and how it compared to troop health. In the May 1800s, we had a national network of volunteer observers. And in about 1850, the telegraph allowed uh, companies to transmit weather conditions free of charge. This was great. So if we had a storm and it was really impacting our city and we knew which direction it was moving, we could telegraph ahead and say, hey, get ready, there's some bad weather coming. In about 1860, the government became even more interested in forecasting because we lost a lot of ships in the Great Lakes due to foul weather. And in 1870, President Grant established 24 stations under the U.S. Army Signal Corps. The Signal Corps, as you can imagine, is responsible for communications in the United States Army. In 1891, it was transferred to civilian hands and it became the new Weather Bureau under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It was then transferred to the Commerce Department. And in, 1860, in 1965, it became the National Weather Service. And this was under the Environmental Science Services Administration, which became the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Now we have about 123 national weather stations and uh, there's a map of them on the next slide. So here we see where these forecast offices are. We also added automated surface observing stations so these record temperature, wind speed, wind direction, humidity, and pressure. And we still have the Cooperative Observer ne Network. So these are member stations that record daily precipitation and maximum temperatures. Kites were used. So first in 1749, and in 1752 we have Ben Franklin using it to show, demonstrate the electrical nature of lightning. After that we use balloons. In about 1804 we went up to about 7,000 meters, so don't forget 5,000 meters is about 3 miles, so a little bit below 6 miles. And in 1862, they went up to about 9 kilometers, which is almost 6 miles. And they almost died from cold and oxygen deprivation. Now we use radiosons. They were invented in the 1920s. And what we do is transmit altitude readings of temperature, dew point, and air pressure. And the data is radioed back down to Earth, so there's no need to recover the equipment. 
Then came ray winsons, and they're tracked by direction finding antennas, and they also provide wind direction and wind speed. Drop winsons are ray winsons that are dropped from a plane instead of sent up by a balloon. So they're dropped from an aircraft on a parachute. These are launched twice a day at the exact same time worldwide and only about 20% of them are actually recovered. So here it shows a picture of a radio sonde and launching it with a balloon. So if you ever find something like this there's a little tag there to tell you where to send it back free of charge. Here shows the locations of the stations and how we display the data is shown in a Stuve diagram. We also have remote sensing. Remote sensing is sensing the how the environment looks by using either signals that are reflected off an object or reflected off the atmosphere or by processing signals that are emitted by the, at the atmosphere. So for example, radar, what we do is send out a signal, it hits a cloud, it comes back, we measure the time it took to get to the cloud and come back and that tells us how far the cloud is away. Satellites record images that are, that are emitted by an object. Now let's talk about the profile of the atmosphere. We start with the, tropopo the troposphere. The troposphere is where most of the weather occurs. And the temperature generally decreases with height. So normally, on the average, it's about 6.5 degrees C per thousand meters, or about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit for thousand feet. The troposphere runs from about 6 kilometers or about 3.7 miles at the poles and about 20 kilometers or about 12 miles at the equator. So it's thicker at the equator than it is at the poles. The upper boundary of this is called the tropopause and this is where temperature becomes constant for a portion of the atmosphere. After that we get the stratosphere that goes up from the tropopause to about 50 kilometers or about 30 miles. And after the temperature being constant for a little bit, then the temperature begins to rise to, to get hotter, it begins to get warmer. So above 20 kilometers or 12 miles, the temperature increases with altitude. This warming is caused by energy released by ozone absorbing ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The stable conditions up there are ideal for jet aircraft travel. However, up in the stratosphere, pollutants can get caught up there for a little while. The upper boundary of the stratosphere is the stratopause where once again temperature is constant for a portion. Next comes the mesosphere and that goes from the stratopause up to about 80 kilometers or 50 miles. Once again the temperature decreases with height. After hitting the mesopause we come up with the thermosphere and here the temperature increases rapidly with height. So here we see a graph of what it looks like. We start on the surface at about 18 degrees C. Okay, about 20 degrees C is room temperature. It decreases at height about 6 degrees per kilometer. That's 6 degrees Celsius. 
Then it remains constant at about negative 60 degrees Celsius. Then as we move up through the stratosphere, there's warming occurring because the, ultra, because the ozone is, is absorbing ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Then we hit the stratopause, where once again temperature is constant for a little bit. Then in the mesosphere, temperature decreases with height to about negative 80 degrees C. Then we hit the mesopause, where the temperature is constant. And then above that, the temperature begins to increase rapidly up to about 80 degrees C. So we said that tropopause is at about 6 kilometers at the poles, at about 12 kilometers at the equator. So we'll call the average to be about 10 kilometers. Above that, we go up to 50 kilometers. That's where the stratopause occurs. And at about 80 kilometers, we get the mesopause. We also have the ionosphere and the aurora. The ionosphere is located mostly in the thermosphere. Here we have a high concentrations of ions and electrons. Ions are electrically charged atomic scale particles and these are caused by the solar energy stripping electrons from the oxygen and nitrogen leaving them to be positive. So electrons are negative. If I take one away, if I have normally a neutral oxygen and nitrogen molecule, they now become positive. Now what happens is subatomic super hot electrically charged particles are carried on the solar wind from the sun. They get caught in the Earth's magnetic field. They collide with these other ions and they form visible lights. Here we see a graph of what ions are available and where they, they occur and to what portions, proportions. So once again we have the solar energy bringing in particles from the sun. They get caught in the Earth's magnetic field and cause things like the aurora borealis. Okay, so that ends our discussion on chapter two, and I'll see you next time.